The following interview is a presentation of Ophion Media. It first aired on KXLU Los Angeles. My guest today is Joshua White, a brilliant pianist and improviser based in the San Diego area and active all over Southern California. His music incorporates a wide array of styles drawn from within and beyond the jazz tradition, and it runs the gamut from what is sometimes called inside to what is sometimes called outside. Of course, uh, there are people who argue that this inside-outside distinction is artificial because at the end of the day, it's all just music, uh, and perhaps the remarkable depth with which uh, Joshua plays both in and out and anywhere in between uh, is a testament to this point. In any case, um, it's a tremendous honor for me to welcome Joshua White to the program. Thank you so much for being with me today. Oh, yeah. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Um, let's see. I want to start by just asking you about sort of your playing style. Um, one thing that I've heard you do, you have this way of playing where you start off with uh what sound like almost, I mean, I'm speaking as a non-musician here. So uh, a lay person, as it were, um, forgive me for maybe not using all the, all the uh, best nomenclature, but you start off playing something that sounds like almost like patterns of notes that are kind of kaleidoscopically moving around each other. And then suddenly it's like they come into phase and they cohere as this like distinctive melody or motif or theme. Uh, and every time I hear you do this, I mean, it's like, my brain is like working overtime to catch up and figure out what just happened. Uh, I don't know if you even know what I'm talking about, but if you do, would you mind uh, talking about this technique a little bit? Well, for, for me, I, I don't know if it's necessarily a technique or a style or if it's just an approach and, you know, how I like to explore, you know, material. You know, so a lot of times what I like to do is I, I, I find for me what's most interesting is not only, you know, um, just the harmonic content or the melodic content, but it's it's the, the structure of the composition. So a lot of what I do, a lot of my approach is centered around interrogating, you know, structure, how things are put together, not necessarily what the contents are, but how, how can I use this? How can I, um, you know, how are these things put together and how many different ways can it be shaped? And ultimately, I'm also looking at the fact that I'm, I'm looking at what are the, you know, the smallest constituent pieces that can be, you know, grouped together that still gives the basic, you know, um, feel, aura, or essence of the composition. You know, like, so how many things can I take away from a particular composition or how many things can I add to a composition and still maintain its, you know, sort of um, cohesion in, in, in terms of, or, or, or con construction in terms of a, a, a total composition and even the idea of what it means to be composed, the idea of what a composition is, I'm always interrogating those sorts of um, boundaries. You know, what does that even mean? So if I'm playing, you know, a Duke Ellington piece, you know, how many different ways can I approach this to, you know, still, you know, maintain the presence of what can be considered a quote unquote melody and, you know, like when when does that melody occur? So if I just play, you know, just uh, clusters of notes, but in the rhythm and you can feel um, uh, the rhythm is strong enough to give a sense of what the composition is based on just the harmonic, uh, the uh, rhythmic content. And perhaps if I'm I'm playing those same cluster clusters and I'm moving the clusters in the direction of you know, the melody, whether it's, you know, uh, if the if the notes in the particular melody are, are going up or going down, does that composition now exist? Or is it purely some sort of uh, concept where that unless you adhere strictly to what the composer in, intended, does that um, uh, composition now take shape? And I'm always, you know, sort of interrogating, what does that even mean to, you know, be composed or, in essence, what, is, what does that mean to exist? So anytime I'm exploring a composition, whether it's my own original pieces or working with other people, that's just like sort of the natural progression of my mind is to figure out, 
and to explore and to interrogate what what am I actually reading? What am I actually playing? What what is actually going on here in terms of the construction, the structure? You know, how, how many different ways can this, you know, material be approached? And for me, that's the interesting part about um, music. It's the way in which all these pieces come together in a sort of, you know, intricate puzzle. And it's, it's an incumbent upon the improviser or, you know, the musician or whoever is interpreting the piece to actually make um, the... Um, make what is essentially music, you know? So that's really my, my approach. And so a lot of times if I do something, I like to start in a place that, you know, really centers upon, um, you know, creating a feel or an environment and finding a way uh, compositionally uh, in performance to connect the more familiar um, uh, 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 more familiar uh, uh, parts of the melody or the composition to this foreign, you know, terrain, you know, and for me, I like to do that because I like to not only get involved in that highly technical process, but also have ways to bring the, uh, the audience or the listening uh, people along with me through that ride. So that's why I like to involve, you know, a lot of standard material so you can hear how, you know, essentially my brain is working when I'm exploring or interrogating these pieces. Thank you so much. I feel like, um, I don't know, I feel like I'm hearing your music as you describe it. Um, <laughs> that's, that's such a like, that's, you know, with the puzzle pieces and all of that, that's, that's such a, I feel like a, 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 that really is uh, how I hear your music too. So it's, it's, it's wonderful to hear you uh, talk about it that way. Um, well, so you talked about um, playing clusters of notes. I, I want to ask you about sort of the dense playing uh, that I've noticed you doing. Uh, and, and two things. One is like really playing clusters of tones, playing, um, a, you know, a lot of keys close together on the piano. Um, and the other is, and again, I mean, I, I may be sort of uh, just going off on my own concept here. So if, if this doesn't resonate with you, please say so. But I feel like I've sometimes seen you develop melodic concepts with sort of your hands close together, like working out ideas uh, in ways that don't have your hands moving around very much. And you're just kind of adding things and adding things and uh, music emerges out of that. So I, yeah, I'd, I'd like to ask you about both of those, the clusters and, and then that kind of close playing. Okay, well, yeah, and I definitely appreciate your perspective because I I feel that you don't have to have a, a technical background or, you know, uh, in, in theory or you know, music theory to, you know, express what it is that you're hearing because I find that, one, we all come from different backgrounds. So whether I'm speaking to another, you know, trained musician or a lay person whose only experience is actually just enjoying the music, I feel that all those perspectives are valid because we're all coming from different places. And if we're trying to communi to get, communicate together as, you know, a uh, performer and listener, there's got to be a, some sort of medium by which we're able to communicate, you know? So I'm always interested in the different perspectives and how people, you know, see things, you know, that to me is interesting about, you know, just in general, the human experience, the amount of um, perspectives and the ways in which things can be interpreted and expressed and communicated, you know, so definitely I, I appreciate, you know, your, so don't, don't worry about like, if it's not technical or anything. Yeah. <laughs> I appreciate that too. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. But in terms of clusters and sounds and developing melodic content, um, first and foremost, I'm interested in the sound, you know, um, and before I continue in that respect, you know, that's very, um, you know, non-descriptive. I do have a, you know, a background in, you know, uh, Western European uh, classical theory, as well as, you know, what is most commonly referred to as jazz, improvised music, you know, that sort of uh, tradition. But Ultimately, I believe that those things provide you with the tools 
and the framework of the the fr the analytical framework by which you're able to you know construct things for yourself or analyze things or be able to communicate ideas you know so with that being said when i get up to perform or even to compose i'm thinking primarily how to you know create interesting you know not only mel melodic content or harmonic content or rhythmic content but in in terms of the you know the whole you know sphere i'm thinking of how does it sound does it sound interesting and so a lot of those things that i explore when the sound is really your only sort of boundary you you sort of uh you sort of approach the music as by any means necessary so if i have to stick my elbow on the piano to get the sound that i want then that's what i'm gonna have to do like if or if i have to use gaffer's tape and do a whole bunch of uh, prepared things in the piano or use magnets or whatever i need to do that's what i'm going to that's how i'm going to approach you know so um you know um using clusters or you know relying on you know western european classical you know technique uh, in, in terms of the piano or theory is all great and good but at the end of the day it's for me in my own playing or when i listen to anyone else it's about the sound you know like how does it make you uh, feel how does it sound how, how are you using it you know in the construction of a you know an entire performance you know so that's really my method in terms of it you know but i know i'll, I'll notice a lot of times because it is sort of an uh an unconventional method in terms of how I produce sound or how I approach the piano, um, it, it immediately draws people's, you know, interest and they try to distinguish that from, you know, a more traditional pathway. But ultimately, I think that, you know, um, that I, as, as with anyone, is the, is the sum of, um, I am the sum of, you know everything that i've learned or that i've uh, picked up over the years and that's it's all open to me when i'm you know performing when i'm sitting at the piano so anything is possible and i just live by the motto of like you know whatever i have to do to get the sound that i'm looking for it's 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 open you know so mm. Mm. yeah and I'm, I'm actually very interested to to delve into talking about some of your um musical in, uh, influences. Um, but before we do that, I, if I can ask a couple more questions about um, form um, and, and just sort of like musicianship. I mean, so one thing I've noticed is that, okay, I mean, you, you, you do very nice work as, a, as an accompanist, um, whether you're play, accompanying a vocalist or you're accompanying an instrumentalist. Um, but I've heard at least some examples. Um, and one that comes to mind is off uh, the Mark Dresser album that you played on uh, ain't nothing but a cyber coup and you this song <laughs> called uh gloaming um which is a cool title uh um where you're basically you're the accompanist for several musicians um who are simultaneously playing melodic instruments um and i guess my question is like as a musician are you using your your brain or your musicality differently when there are multiple melodic lines that you're accompanying rather than one um well I, i'll i'll answer that as um i sort of did for the last question it's for for me i'm not necessarily thinking primarily of the instrument or necessarily the player uh individually but i'm just thinking of it as in in, in terms of approaching you know, whatever sounds that I hear. So whatever happens, you know, whatever melodic line, if it's coming from a flute, like a flutist like Nicole Mitchell or um, a trombone player like uh, Michael Dessen, you know, it's um, it's really reacting to um, the, the sounds that you hear, you know, because you really can't anticipate what's going to happen. I mean, we have, you know, the written material or what have you, but in terms of being an improviser and interpreting, you know, original pieces or standard uh, material, it's about the interaction and the interplay between the musicians and ultimately what they decide or decide not to play, you know? So I just really try to be in tune 
with, um, you know, all of my sensibilities as a, um, as a, as a listener and try to become an even more deep listener when I'm, you know, working with other musicians and being aware of the, the musical space that we all inhabit as, you know, collective imp improvisers or, you know, performers, you know, so with that being said, I definitely think that um, a, a certain level of sensitivity is required, you know, um, when, you know, working with, you know, a larger group or even a smaller group. But I also subscribe to the, you know, um, the perspective of not just being a um, listener and reacting, but having the ability to provoke reactions out of others, to be a sort of catalyst to move the music into different directions. You know, it's about that push and pull, you know, that sensitivity and, you know, provocation to, you know, um, you know, move the music to wherever, you know, you know, wherever we can, you know, imagine it to go, you know. Mm. And, and yeah, with a lot of these musicians um, who you've recorded with and who you perform with, uh, you do have such a, I feel like, um, you know, recognizable sense of conversationality and um, intentionality in the playing, you know, I mean, it, 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 it even when it's very abstract, I feel like there's um I don't want to use the word structure, but let's call it like sculpture or something. Mm -hmm. There's like, there's definitely something intentional there. Um, how, how do you develop that rapport with musicians? Do you find it on the first time you play together or does it take a lot of? Well, I'll, I'll say uh, the first part of your question or, or what I'm hearing is um, there's definitely an overarching concept of, um, you know, so, so I'm not trying to, I think for the for the longer term in terms of performance and thinking compositionally, you know, how not just not only just reacting in, in the music, but how does this composition or how does this performance, you know, have a sort of arc in the in whatever particular number we're playing and then also within the set of music that we're playing or within the night. You know what I mean? And a lot of times that will take form in my, uh, so say for instance, if I have like a trio performance and we start off on the first number and we go in a different direction that we hadn't performed um, before, like say for instance, if we're playing over a couple of nights, then for that next piece, I'll in intentionally push it in a direction that will, um, you know, sort of provoke a different reaction you know, instead of approaching things the same way every time, I'm always looking for a new and interesting uh, pathway to get through the composition. And a lot of times that's dictated by what we've previously just done. You know, so if we've, and, and that could be anything. So I, for the second piece, like in this fictitious set, I may change the key. I may change the, the uh, if I start off with a piano in introduction, I might change the key. I might change the meter. I might change the feel. I might change the time signature. I might tell the, the drummer, uh, uh, you start, you start somewhere and then we'll find a way to get into it or the bass player to do an open introduction, or I'll just do something and then immediately go into another piece. You know, all of those things are game, but I'm always trying to think compositionally and, you know, trying to achieve an overall feel for not only the piece, but how it fits within the, the broader structure of a set or the evening, you know? And then uh, I think the second part of your question was in regards to having a connection with um, other members in, you know, the working band, whether it's instantaneous or it develops over time. And I will say this, with the musicians with whom I work with, you know, most frequently, um, I would definitely say that there is a sort of immediate, um, you know, connection, rapport, or a sort of understanding, you know. And I think a lot of that has to do with a, a sensitivity to, um, you know, the idea of conversation, meaning that um, not only do they value your input, 
but you value their input and they're always approaching things from, um, you know, introducing an idea that's not only honest, but something that you haven't necessarily thought of previously, you know, and have an interesting take on how to um, approach the music. Because for me, uh, in my own groups and when I work with, um, you know, people around town, I like to find it's like you don't have to be the most technically advanced or, you know, have the most facility or do, you know, anything of that sort. I'm just looking for an interesting voice, a distinct voice, a distinct approach, you know, and somebody who's able to, you know, um, with that distinct voice, able to, you know, help shape the music as a, you know, collective, you know, ultimately. And that, that, that's, the, the, that's the only thing I'm really looking for is that sort of distinct voice and a sort of sensitivity and appreciation for the voices of others. Mm, mm, yeah, thank you so much for that, um, for that answer. I feel like these have all been uh, very rich responses that you've been giving me. Um, mm. One more question on, on playing style and then we'll, we'll move on to some other topics. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, both having seen you live and then reviewing some of your live performances and album performances um, for this interview, I've noticed um, that you're a little bit of a vocalizer and I love that so much. You know, I, um, a lot of my favorite musicians when they improvise, uh, you know, obviously vocalize. And I, I have taken um, music lessons back in the day um, from actually a, a Ghanaian xylophonist um, who was a totally stunning improviser uh, and did a lot of vocalization when he was, when he was really getting into it. Um, and so I'd be interested to hear you just reflect on, on that, like, since you're someone who um, seems to dig so deep when you, when you improvise, um, how does vocalization fit into it? Well, I would say for me personally, um, vocalization isn't necessarily an intentional part of my music. It's, I, I feel that, you know, you know, connecting the piano with my voice or just a voice in general really helps to center, you know, the, um, the improvisational ideas and make them, you know, sort of, um, instead of just a sort of uh, pianist, pianistic, you know, um, you know, sort of digital approach, um, it sort of connects connects with the sort of human sensibility of the improviser, you know, sort of takes it out of just the realm of, you know, playing the chords or playing the, the changes, as it were, and really connecting with, you know, a sort of um, another another side of your your musical voice, you know, because a lot of times the piano can be, you know, very cold and unforgiving, you know, sort of presence, you know, and I feel like for me personally, col col collecting with, uh, I mean, connecting with a sort of vocalization helps center, you know, my ideas and my approach. And there's, there's something to be said about being able to, you know, um, you know, sing a melody or to have it, you know, sort of, um, you know, dictate your phrasing, you know, it, it sort of brings in a more, um, if I might use, you know, the word like a sort of hu more human element, as opposed to just the, um, uh, the machinery of the piano, you know. So I wouldn't say it's intentional, but sometimes, you know, I just, I just go for it, you know. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Um, so, I want to ask you now, sort of, I guess, stepping back from uh, talking about your hands on the instrument um, and talking more about sort of your journey through music and, and uh, the meaning of the music uh, and, and questions related uh, to those kinds of topics. Um, I, it seems to me, and, and to a lot of other people, obviously, right, that you have such a unique voice on the instrument. Um, and certainly listening to your music, uh, you know, it's, it's very evident that you, that you really uh, know your musical history um, because your playing contains all these traces of um, styles and ideas and stuff that I feel like uh, come down from, from past uh, great players, but ultimately you put that all together into something that's, that's very uh, distinctively yours. Um, 
I wonder if you could share a little bit about your, your journey to develop your voice and kind of boil it down into what it is today. Well, um, well, I say in terms of my influences, they are, you know, you know, in terms of the tradition, they dig, you know, deep, you know, way down far into many, um, you know, American and even, you know, world uh, traditions. And, you know, I started my musical studies, um, you know, um, around the age of seven, you know, um, exploring Western European um, classical music from, you know, uh, Beethoven, Chopin, Bach, you know, um, all of those, you know, all of those, uh, Mozart, um, all of those composers and, you know, studying the, the, the piano tradition. But I was also influenced by the music that I heard, you know, just growing up as a young child, you know, so that's, you know, hip hop, R&B, rock, to grunge, to metal, to country, to, to gospel music. And I think to a certain extent that all informs, um, you know, sort of my musical perspective, like I said earlier, in terms of, you know, being the sum of, you know, the things that I've learned or that I've heard or that I've, you know, worked through. And, you know, so I feel, I feel like that all has shaped me in terms of my approach. But I would say more than that, it's, you know, uh, my approach to music, but I would say more than that, it's about, I think what distinguishes my playing is my approach to, you know, the structure and the, the analytics and the, 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 the sort of uh, the analytical approach and the sort of interrogation of actually what does this mean? You know, so the border, um, you know, so defining, you know, uh, chords or defining a genre or defining a rhythm or, you know, sort of defining what it means to be composed or to be a composition. I think that that process of interrogation and me working it out at the piano or as a composer is what really shapes my approach or my playing. Because other than that, it's just, you know, chords, rhythm, and melody. But I think what gives it the, the improvisations or the compositions or the playing its shape is, you know, how those things are used, you know, and, that, and that's really what it is for me when I listen to anyone else, because, you know, yeah, you can all play like a G, uh, a G7, you know, chord. Yeah. But how do you use that in the context of, you know, your improvisation or, you know, playing any note, any chord, any rhythm, you know, that's all well and good, but how do you use them? You know, it's the, it's the same with any, um, you know, say, for instance, a writer, you know, you can go to, you know, the best schools and you can have, you know, um, you know, whatever certifications and you can be well read um, and you can use the same words as, you know, um, anyone else, you know, in terms of if you're writing a, um, an essay or an abstract or even a fiction novel. But I think that what distinguishes, you know, you know, you know the amateur from, you know, the great is how they use the tools that they've acquired, you know, through their studies, you know? So yes, I can write a, you know, short story taking every single word that, you know, Toni Morrison used in one of her novels, you know, but that doesn't mean I'm going to, you know, be as a, an effective writer as she, you know, it's that perspective and how we use the tools and how we use the information that we know, I think what is ultimately what defines us because, um, you know, those are the, those are the decisions. Those are the choices that we, um, those are the choices that we use or that we make, you know? Mm, mm. Um, yeah. And I, you know, I've heard you talk in some of your, your old interviews um, about, you know, steeping yourself in the work of not only musicians, but because you just mentioned Toni Morrison, and this is sort of why this question comes to mind, but also visual artists and poets and writers and things of that nature. Um, can you talk about what it means to you to create from a place of, of being steeped in the thought uh, of other great creatives? Um, and, and, you know, what it means uh, to you to, to create art uh, 
in kind of the in the same historical arc as the people who influence you? Yeah, sure. Well, I, I, I can approach it from this point is that for me, as I, you know, began to grow and develop in music, um, sometimes the music took on a, um, a characteristic of being purely, you know, um, technical, meaning that the more I became, you know, uh, more well-versed in sort of um, the theory and the technique, I began to, you know, and perhaps this is a, a natural part of the process, lose the sort of um, imaginary or, um, you know, uh, imaginary aspects of the music, meaning that when you're listening to a record, right, as, as opposed to being it, you know, you're being able to enjoy it, it's like, I'm transcribing it in my head. I can hear everything that the pianist is doing. I can hear everything the saxophonist is doing, like literally, and write it out, you know? So when you have that sort of instinct or approach or, you know, technical, you know, background, the music can lose some of its m mystique. So sometimes you're, you're not necessarily inspired by it, although you can learn from it. It doesn't really sort of activate the, you know, sort of, creative um, spaces in your mind or more specifically in my mind, you know, so what I found that helps me, you know, sort of retain that sort of, um, you know, creative space is to really engage in other, you know, forms of, you know, art or communication, you know, so being, you know, being able to read a wonderful novel or a historical fiction or, you know, um, you know, all sorts of essays, nonfiction, poetry, science, philosophy, all of that, all of those um, things, I, I believe helps, you know, helps me engage in, um, you know, the sort of more uh, creative aspects in the sense that in order to, you know, understand what's going on within these, um, within the written word or these uh, these uh, books or novels or whatever you're you're engaged in, it requires a certain level of visualization, and for me that you know gets directly into um, you know uh, the visualization the the visualization uh, gets me directly into that sort of you know imaginary sort of space, being able to imagine these different environments, these different worlds, these different settings. So if I'm reading a novel by um, or a short story by Jamaica Kincaid, you know, being able to understand what's happening, you have to be able to, you know, take these words on a page and be able to visualize them in your mind and to create these sort of worlds in your head. And for me, that space has really, you know, being able to engage in that sort of thinking, that sort of creativity has really, I believe, more than anything, help shape my music because I'm not thinking in purely technical terms. I'm thinking using my um, mind as a, you know, uh, uh, as a way to visualize and to imagine new things. So ultimately there isn't, the only boundary is what I'm able to imagine. You know, I'm not bound by, you know, sort of the more theoretical aspects of music or art. It's, it's purely driven by, what am I able to imagine, you know, with whatever I'm given or whatever I have or whatever I bring, you know? Mm, mm. Beautiful. Um, and, and would you mind sharing your thoughts on one or two books or pieces of writing that you've connected with recently? Um, well, I'll, I'll share. Um, I'm in the process of reading through, you know, um, as I mentioned before, Jamaica Kincaid, all of her works, all of her published works. Um, and what I most admire about her work for me right now is the sort of raw energy and sort of truth telling in her perspective. It's very potent, very strong. And, you know, I couldn't get enough when I first started um, reading her her work you know i believe the first piece uh, the first book i read was annie john you know and she really tells about you know um her life as a um you know th through her writing 
you know, the, the life of um, people coming up in the, you know, West, West Indies, you know, and just like her sp perspective on the world and on people and on family is just something that I had not experienced before. And I was immediately drawn into her world and her environment. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. Mm. Um, let's see. So when I, when I saw you perform last, meaning the most recently, that was in August of 2021 at Sam first. Um, and you, which is, which is, by the way, I should say for, for listeners who don't know is a great um, jazz bar in the Los Angeles area near LAX, near the airport. Um, you, you played a song and, and, and made a little uh, really nice spoken tribute um, to the late pianist, Jerry Allen. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about her as an artist uh, and her significance uh, to you specifically? Yeah, um, I would say that for me, Jerry, you know, Ellen has been one of the, one of the more important voices in um, piano of the last um, 30 years. Her commitment and integrity to, you know, the tradition as well as just being a overall, you know, wonderful composer, improviser, pianist, band leader, you know, I, I would say is nothing short of astounding and, you know, ultimately very inspiring. And what I appreciate most about her is, um, you know, just her integrity to follow her own vision. You know, she has a distinct voice. It's like you, the, her approach to chords and melody and harmony and, 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 and rhythm, you know, are very much, you know, um, you know, her own, you know, development, but you can also hear, you know, the, the deep rooted traditions in her playing, whether it's, you know, um, Andrew Hill to Herbie Hancock to, you know, the great, you know, artist of Motown, you know, Detroit, um, you know, to Stravinsky, to Eric Dolphy, you know, it's all there, but it's ultimately, you know, the product is, you know, her own, you know, and, and also too, I just really enjoy listening to her play and her, um, her albums, you know, they're, they're just really great, you know, but ultimately that integrity to, you know, follow her own vision, you know, I, I, I just really am very much inspired by what she has done, you know. Mm, mm. Yeah, really, um, like you said, I mean, just, uh, just an unbelievable, uh, such a wonderful artist. Um, I'm not sure if this is the right time to bring this up, but I mean, since we're sort of talking about Jerry Allen, who I feel like uh, her presence is still felt uh, to a large extent, even though she's no longer with us. Um, I wanted to ask you for your, um, maybe your thoughts on a couple other uh, recently departed uh, people. Um, and this is sort of just a random grab bag, uh, partly from trawling your social media and also just uh, as a jazz listener. Um, Curious if you have any thoughts on on Barry Harris, uh, who we lost in late 2021. Oh, OK. Yeah, I would say that Barry Harris is one of the the the, the true um, carriers of, you know, what most commonly referred to is bebop of like, you know, the, the traditions of bebop and just swing and just uh, overall wonderful um you know, piano playing. And I would say that um, I was heavily influenced by his work because one of the first people that I met when I, when I began my journey into the study of the tradition of, you know, what's most commonly referred to as jazz um, and improvised music was, uh, you know, being able to work with the great um, Charles McPherson, the alto saxophonist and composer. And for anybody who knows, uh, Charles McPherson's history is that he was a student of the great um, Barry Harris back in um, Detroit, and how I became to be how I came to be influenced by Barry Harris is that upon meeting Charles McPherson, my whole thing was is anybody that I meet. So in order to, for for me to learn about this music, 
my my whole thing was okay I, I have to hear it i have to learn it so anybody that i would meet i would buy all of their records that were available at tower records or online and then i would listen and study and for all of the records that i had with charles mcpherson barry harris was on them so i figured oh he must be somebody to know <laughs> and so from there i got as many Barry Harris, you know, records that I possibly could. And, you know, in that sort of formative uh, time in my development, you know, I was very much, you know, I can definitely hear he was coming out of, you know, players like Bud Powell, but I felt like he had his own distinct, you know, uh, approach and clarity to the piano. And I, you know, I, I loved, you know, I absolutely loved his playing. And I even wrote a composition in my early development that nobody has ever heard and I will never play. <laughs> but but it was called uh, Listen to Barry Harris. You know, it's it's very, uh, uh, very amateur and rudimentary, but, you know, it's a part of my process and development. I'll never play it, but <laughs> it's it's there. So I would definitely count him as a major influence. And I think, you know, even though he's... Uh, he has since uh, passed away. I think his influence, you know, in terms of the uh, into in the music community as a not only as a musician and a pianist and composer, but as an educator, you know, he'll he'll his his legacy will never die. So, mm. and I think that message, uh, listen to Barry Harris, is a good one, even if even if you're not going to share the song with us. <laughs> <laughs> no. Another one, another recently departed um, person who who I wanted to get your two cents on um, the the incredible uh, thinker and feminist Bell Hooks, who also passed away in late 2021. Bell Hooks. OK, so. I will say that probably of most any other writer, Bell Hooks has been the most influential in terms of how I, you know, critique and analyze and just look at things, you know, it could be out, outside of music, just, um, um, just, you know, world events, you know, um, she has such a sort of potent, powerful, you know, biting critique. And it's, it, for me, it's, a um, it's, it's somebody who is very intent and focused on the details and looking for a sort of consistency in, um, you know, what you say and what you do, you know. And I was just, upon reading, I think the first book I read was um, Killing Rage, you know, which was filled with a bunch of uh, personal essays and um, sort of... Uh, critiques on, you know, um, you know, polit political and, you know, um, the political climate uh, at the time and her own experiences as a, you know, academic and as a woman, as a Black woman um, dealing with, you know, um, everything going on in society. And I, I just immediately fell in love with her work and her writing. And since I've probably read over 30 of her books. I, I think there's might be two or three that have been published that I have not read, but I will, um, I'll probably buy them this year and I'll, and I'll read through them. But yeah, I'm, you know, I love, you know, I love her writing and, and, and it's not only just, um, uh, it's not only just criticism, but she writes, you know, uh, poetry, she writes children's books, you know, so I, I definitely, believe that, you know, one, everyone should listen to Barry Harris and two, everybody should read Bell Hooks. So. Excellent. Excellent. That's amazing too, that you've, that you've gone so deep into her. Um, mm -hmm. I guess you wouldn't call it a catalog for an author, but that's, that's super cool. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so since, since we're already kind of talking about other people, um, I, I was planning to ask you later about uh, some of your collaborators, but, but maybe I'll just go ahead and do that now. Um, I'm pretty sure that my introduction to your work uh, was attending a concert um, where you were playing in a sextet with Nicole Mitchell, Jeff Parker, Michael Dessen, Emma Dayhuff, and Alex Klein, uh, which is just an unbelievable, excuse me, an unbelievable lineup. Um, 
first of all, I'm curious how you got involved playing with all those people. Um, and, and I know that I'm setting you up for a super long answer here, um, but I'd also love to hear your reflections on Nicole Mitchell, on Michael Dess, and on Alex Klein, uh, all of whom I know you've played with pretty extensively. And I'm not sure how much you've played with Jeff Parker, Emma Dayhuff, but I'd love to hear uh, what you have to say about them as well. Okay, so I'm not sure that I totally remember that concert because I've played with them in so many different contexts over the years. So um, I'm not even sure who was the leader. I believe it might've been Michael Dessen because I believe I've worked with Emma and Michael in um, performance, you know, under Michael's leadership. But um, I think you might be right about that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that's, that's what it was, but I will say that a lot of my introduction to uh, uh, what I'll return, uh, what I'll term is, you know, sort of creative music, uh, new music, modern music, or whatever have you, would be through um, my, um, you know, my collaborations with the great Mark Dresser. You know, he's, you know, over the years, he's been so gracious and so kind to have me involved with uh, many of his projects, both locally and, you know, his recorded projects and, you know, playing in New York or, you know, Boston or touring or what have you. And so through him, I've met, you know, so many wonderful musicians like Nicole Mitchell, um, um, I believe Alex Klein, uh, Michael Dessen, um, I mean, there, there's like, there's so many people. I, I just, I would have to look on the discographies to, you know, sort of uh, remember who we've uh, worked with. But um, I would say that, yeah, most definitely, I've had an opportunity to work with many wonderful, wonderful um, musicians, and it's always been, you know, quite a wonderful experience. And I will say that working with Nicole Mitchell and playing her original music has always been you know, so inspiring because one, she is a prolific, prolific writer and composer. I mean, she can churn out these incredible works, whether it's solo piano, solo fl flute, large ensemble. I mean, and I, I, I always, I always hope that, you know, all of her one, that she gets the recognition that she most certainly deserves. And two, that all of her compositions and all of her papers are, you know, saved and preserved for, you know, time because people really need to understand what she's doing, you know? Um, but yeah, like working with her and having the opportunity right before the, the, the pandemic have, you know, being able to, you know, play the, the Cape town, uh, uh, jazz festival in South Africa, you know, um, just, you know, um, working with um, Mark Dresser, of course, being one of the most um, creative and inspiring composers I've ever worked with. I mean, his music, if, if I were to, if I were to um, qualify, I would say that he's probably my favorite composer, you know, because he writes these such beautiful melodies and such interesting um, chord movements. And I love working with him and I even love playing his music as a um, solo pianist. I remember I did a, a concert here in San Diego where I played the music of Mark Dresser, just solo piano. And because I just love, you know, his music. And of course, you know, his playing is second to none. I mean, he's one of the most incredible, you know, bass players of the last, you know, 50 years with a creative approach that has no match as far as I can see you know, but, um, oh, uh, Jeff Parker, I, I feel like for a lot of these, uh, my collaborations with these wonderful musicians is just, you know, it's par for course of working on the scene, you know, so, um, you know, if you just keep working and just work, keep, uh, you know, opening yourself up to many different experiences, you'll meet and collaborate with, a lot of wonderful musicians. So Jeff Parker, I've had the opportunity to play in some of his groups. We've played together in some of Eric Rivas, uh, the bass player, Eric Rivas, his groups. Um, Jeff Parker's played in my groups. I played in his groups. 
you know, it's, and we've always had a great time. And I think really that's, that's what really um, my um, choice in terms of collaborator is really dictated from. It's about, you know, if we're able to, you know, sort of develop a, a certain rapport and, you know, play something interesting ultimately, you know. For sure, for sure. Um, there's a couple other collaborators I'd, I'd love to ask you about, and I'll just say the name. You can give me uh, as long or as short as an answer uh, of an answer as you feel like. Um, start with Anna Butters. Oh yeah, Anna Butters, an incredible um, bass player who I who I've worked with in many different ensembles, and most recently my trio. And what I love about her playing is that sound of her on the bass and when she i there's a distinct way in which she plays a note that immediately cuts through the band and just lays this sort of interesting you know foundation for the group you know it's like when when i hear her sound it's like these these notes or these um these sorts of um brilliant orbs that you know um sort of orbit the the band the bandstand or the you know the stage and she just has such an interesting perspective and ultimately is a great person as well so she always brings a great energy to the band and just is really open to go anywhere you know Mm -hmm. she's such a wonderful player um i also want to ask about tina raymond oh yeah well Tina Raymond, I forget how we first connected. It might have been through uh, Dan Rosenboom, trumpeter and composer Dan Rosenboom. But um, again, another uh, wonderful musician in Los Angeles. And I mean, just her playing and her sort of uh, approach to the drums and being able to to hit a groove and to lock in and to just really, you know, set the ball rolling and to take it from there and just take the music really high, you know? And um, we've had the opportunity to play in like many different settings as well. And also too, it's it's like, I, I was so incredibly happy when she became the um, director of jazz studies at CSU Northridge, you know what I mean? Because it's, it's, for me, it really is a signal of, um, you know, how some educational institutions are really valuing the work of, you know, um, professional or working musicians who are still, you know, like on the scene playing, you know, and really are open to, you know, um, you know, I don't want to say like new music, but just instead of, um, promoting and hiring people from within the institution, you're really, you know, um, I think they should really look to the practitioners who are actually on the scene playing as well. You know, absolutely. Um, and actually, the next name I was going to mention, you took it out of my mouth, Daniel Rosenboom. Oh yeah. Oh man, the 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 entrepreneur, the musical entrepreneur of Los Angeles. I mean, you know, outside of being a prolific composer and a an incredible player, I mean, his just business mind and his. Um, sort of the energy and, you know, sort of the initiative and, you know, sort of driven nature to, you know, not only, you know, start his own record label, to, but to really, through that record label, build a community for the creative music scene in Southern California and, you know, Los Angeles and Southern California or, you know, the broader, you know, musical communities as a whole, you know, so I'm, I'm definitely um, most certainly inspired by, you know, his work, his energy and his ability to, you know, um, not only, you know, um, work toward, you know, realizing his own vision as an artist and a musician, but really opening the doors up for other, you know, musicians and creators and collaborators to, you know, um, you know, work together and, you know, realizing their vision through, you know, Arenda Records, you know. Mm, mm. And uh, am I correct in my research that you've uh, you've done some playing with um, Rudresh Mahantapa? Oh yes, um, yeah. I actually had the opportunity to um, tour Europe, I believe, 
twice um, in 2015, 2016, and I think we might have done something again in 2017, um, you know, when he had his uh, bird calls project. And mm. that was an amazing experience for me because one, it was my first time heading to Europe, let alone touring these big um, or playing these big halls and um, music festivals and such. But his playing, Rudresh, uh, Rudresh Mahanthapa, his playing is at such a, you know, incredibly high le level and just brings so much energy that it forces you to, you know, really, you know, step up and to make sure that, you know, you're bringing that energy as well, you know? So it was, it was definitely a, 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 a great learning experience for me because I'm trying to learn from every experience and trying to play with as many different, you know, people as I possibly can. And I'll, I'll never forget my first time meeting him was in uh, Belgrade, Serbia on the day of the gig where we were supposed to hit. And, you know, it was, it was an, it was a different kind of pressure but one that I definitely, um, you know, welcomed, you know. So here I am stepping into a, a situation where I've never played with any of the, the band members before. I've never been to this country before. And I've never been to Europe before. And I've never played any of this music, you know, never performed it. And all of those things are happening on the same day in front of an audience who's paid to, you know, see a wonderful performance. So it was, you know, it was fun. It was, it was something like I, I love doing and I'm definitely appreciative to um, Rudresh for giving me that, you know, opportunity to experience, you know, playing with his band featuring um, Rudy Royston on drums and Dan Weiss also uh, shared duties on drums as well as, um, uh, Adam O'Farrell on trumpet mm. and um, Francois Mouton. Uh, there it is. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Yep. <laughs> nice. One. Okay. That, that, Francois. Okay. That's yeah. But yeah, all incredible musicians. And it was just like um, performing that music was such an incredible experience, you know, because they had already a deep rapport. They've already recorded the album. They've played together in on the New York scene. And here I am trying to pick up on all this subtle, not only like get a, a, very, a, a deep hold on the music, but also try to master their, you know, subtle cues of, you know, because the music has developed since the album. The album has was a starting point and they had already been touring. So the, the music has changed and shifted into different forms. So there's no just like, oh, I'm listening to the album and I'll understand what's happening. It's like you have to really be sensitive and aware of how the music has changed and also the individual approaches of each of these musicians, you know? So, but yeah, definitely it's... It, I, I always think fondly on that time, but not in a sense of... Um, um, like nostalgia. Oh, I want to go back. It, it, it helped inform what I do now, you know? Mm, mm. You got to say the whole getting thrown into the deep end thing sounds terrifying to me. I, I really respect uh, musicians who, who uh, go through that and, and come out the other side. Um, I think you've played with uh, Chess Smith a little bit, right? Oh yes. Yeah. Actually we recorded, um, we recorded an album with saxophonist Jason Robinson. Um, the album also features uh, Drew Gress on bass. And the, the project was called Harmonic Constituent, um, a really wonderful album with uh, great compositions written by Jason Robinson. And yeah, I, I absolutely loved, you know, joining uh, Jason's band. And we most recently we had a performance or a few performances in the Boston, Connecticut area, which were, you know, amazing, fun. And I hope we get to do more stuff with those groups, you know, and I, what I also too love is like being able to connect with, you know, musicians on the East coast, because I'm always playing with a lot of the, the musicians and uh, composers on the, the West coast, but, you know, a lot of people like to say that there's a, a certain type of energy that comes from, you know, 
players who've lived in New York for many, many years or who've been on the, the New York scene. And for me, I don't necessarily subscribe to that in totality, but I do like to work with different musicians from who have different backgrounds and from different parts of the world or different perspectives, ultimately, you know. Mm, mm, for sure, for sure. Um, and I was also not sure how, it seems like you've done at least some playing with um, Jonathan Pinson. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, he actually recorded on my debut album, we played together and we've played my some of my trio gigs and some of my larger ensemble um, work. And, you know, we've played together as uh, sidemen and other, other um, with other groups. Um, yeah, he's a, a fiery, fantastic um, player, um, uh, such a creative and such a bright, you know, energy. And I, I believe one of the first performances, or maybe not first performances, we played at, you know, the now um, defunct Blue Whale in Los Angeles, downtown LA, with Ambrose Akamusuri and mm. Jeff Parker. I I think it was Dave Robert on bass, but I'm not totally sure. But Jim, uh, John Pinson was, Jonathan Pinson was on drums, you know, so... And that was quite a few years ago. So we've been playing together for, for, for a minute. Yeah. Cool. Cool. I'm sad. I missed that gig. It sounds like it was probably a good one. Oh, yeah. um, the last collaborator I want to ask you about is uh, Steph Richards. Uh, you guys came out with the album Zephyr in uh, 2021. Yeah. Well, I believe you asked earlier about, you know, sort of, does a rapport happen immediately or does it develop over time? And I'll say with Steph Richards, I don't remember the first performance or how we first met, but I do remember that whenever that was, our sort of rapport, our sort of connection was on the bandstand. It was instant, you know, because I immediately understood her openness to explore many different ideas and she understood mine. And, you know, ultimately we're about, you know, playing something creative and, you know, exploring many different pathways to um, producing sound, you know? So, um, I mean, I, you know, not enough um, can be said about Steph Richards and her, you know, musicianship as a, you know, um, performer as a composer, but she is just all around an incredible musician and just a wonderful person. And it's it's been a pleasure to collaborate and to work with her. And I hope that she's available to work on my uh, upcoming projects because she is incredibly busy, but it's always a pleasure to um, work with Steph. She's amazing. Beautiful. And it's, it's, it's funny that you uh, connected your answer back to my question about rapport, because when I wrote that question, I was actually listening to some of your duo work uh, with Steph. Um, obviously the, the, the conversationality is, is really strong when you guys play together. Um, I want to ask a little bit about the people you've studied under. I, I've heard that you studied under Mike Wofford to some extent. Mm -hmm. I think I heard there might be some kind of Anthony Davis connection. Um, I'd love for you to talk about them and anyone else who had a, a significant direct impact on you, whether they're a pianist or otherwise. Oh, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll say that um, my primary um, um, teacher or the, the most impactful, I would say, are um, at the at the the beginnings of my studies um, with my first piano teacher, uh, Jennifer Martin. And, um, you know, I studied with her from about the age of seven to 17. And when I say studied, it's basically, I had a lesson a week that towards the end of my time was about an hour, an hour and a half, you know, for like 10 years, you know, she was probably the most, um, you know, influential in terms of, you know, how I, you know, approach the piano, but also to, you know, having played in church for a, a long time, I was influenced by, you know, the other, other church pianists, you know, so I would, I would say that 
uh, Jennifer Martin on the Western European classical side and Barbara Conley for the um, sort of, um, you know, African-American gospel tradition side are the ones that really shaped how I, you know, play when I sit at the piano. And as an improviser, I would say that it was through the UCSD jazz camp um, early years, back in the early 2000s, you know, it was a summer program about a week long. And through that program, you had the opportunity to take one or two lessons with, you know, all of the faculty, you know, so I had the opportunity to work with, you know, pianist Eric Reed, pianist Mike Wofford, um, pianist composer uh, Anthony Davis, um, and the, you know, the list goes on. Um, so ha having, you know, sort of that experience of working with those um, musicians, uh, flutist Holly Hoffman, um, all of those musicians, you know, helped influence and shape the direction. But in terms of um, improvised, you know, jazz, uh, you know, what's most commonly referred to as jazz music, um, it was really sort of a, a sort of self-driven, you know, course of study, you know, um, you know, having met people along the way you know, whether it's through the UCSD jazz camp or what have you, the, the, the approach in terms of improvised and, you know, jazz music um, was really about me sitting down. And once the door was opened, it was, there was no stopping it, you know? So I would count just me really studying the re recordings is really what helped me progress. You know, and I when I say studying the recordings, I mean, you know, relentlessly, you know, um, listening for, you know, eight to 10 hours a day. You know, when I would when I would study, um, you know, Art Tatum, I would listen to the recordings for hours on end. Um, when I was in college, going to San Diego State and taking some music classes, you know, if the the professor named an example of a record, I would go out and get, you know, so say for instance, if the um, professor was talking about a solo by Charlie Parker and off of a particular record, and I was like, oh, I don't have that record. So I would go out, I remember specifically going out and getting the complete Savoy and Dial sessions, complete um, Verve sessions, and then listening to them chronologically. And if you know what that means, that's like, like 25 CDs of material, you know, and listening to them all chronologically in order to get a sense of like what's happening and just sitting there and listening and then repeat listening over and over and over and over and memorizing the solos, memorizing what's happening uh, as the pianist comps or as the drummer comps or the bass lines and really, you know, shape, really shaping my ear in terms of the language of the music. So I would say out of anything, it's really, you know, sort of my passion and my love for, you know, not only ear training, but just, you know, being able to visualize and hear and to, to, be, to, to be able to analyze through listening, you know, mm, yeah. not, necess not necessarily somebody sitting down and showing you what to do. It's being able to, for me, it's, it's about the challenge of being able to figure it out. And then if called upon to explain, to be able to give a, you know, convincing, you know, answer or perspective of why you chose what you chose based off of, you know, the material. Hmm. Amazing. Amazing. Um, and sort of just to, to follow up, I mean, you've, you've kind of touched on it in earlier answers, but um, I wonder if you could say just a couple words about how um, your early training in European classical music and in the music of the Black church figures into what you do today like is it a conscious thing or is it just so deep in there that you don't even touch it directly it's just kind of there well i i would say it's a little of both because it's definitely conscious um well i say the western european classical music i would say gave me a different sort of discipline in terms of how i approached like playing the piano and being able to 
get the control to be able to, you know, articulate a specific idea, you know? So if I want to approach something dynamically, having the training to, okay, say for instance, understanding the, um, you know, the pedals of the piano, learning how to uh, uh, utilize my hands in terms of the amount of pressure that I want to, uh, you know, if I want to depress a key, knowing how to get these different timbers and, you know, sounds out of the piano and not just the piano in general, but different pianos because they're all, you know, require different, you know, sort of techniques to get the sound that you're looking for into understanding the different characteristics of each instrument, you know? And what I would say about, you know, sort of the, the black music, you know, uh, uh, gospel tradition, having that sort of uh, study helped me learn and understand how music can affect people, you know, because a lot of times with Western European classical music, it's really, you know, sort of the study is in the, um, you know, in the practice room, and then you might have a recital here and there, you know, until you actually get to a professional level and people come to hear, you know, pay to come and hear you, but playing in church, it's like you're there every Sunday and you're seeing how the music and how the rhythm can affect people. So knowing how to play something and get something to tap their feet, get someone to tap their feet or to clap along with the beat or how to get a groove or how to bring something to a sort of um, higher plane you know, a higher feeling or to, you know, to evoke different emotions. It gives you, for me, it gave me a different sort of training and how to, you know, communicate ideas. So if I want to build up a certain amount of tension and then get a certain amount of release in the moment, as opposed to hearing to what's strictly written on a score, you know, what sort of music and environment that you, you need to, you know, um, invoke in order to do that you know ultimately you know understanding what praise and worship and how that you know affects people and how that affects you know the parishioners you know and what emotional what emotional responses can be invoked through these you know notes and spaces and things mm -hmm. yeah thank you so much for that answer um so, so I want to ask you now a little bit um, to describe sort of briefly what your practice regimen is like nowadays. And also if it's significantly different, which it sounds like it probably is um, from, from how you would practice earlier on when you were more working on developing your voice. Uh, I wonder if you could comment on the differences as well. Well, I would say um, in the beginning, like in my more formative years that I had the traditional sort of practice routine that most um, you know, developing musicians have. I mean, it's just really understanding and getting a hold of the instrument, you know? And I'd say I'm still working on that now, and I definitely could practice a lot more, um, you know? But I'd say, like, my practice routine now is really ear training based, and, um, you know, I've been doing a lot of um, just getting faster and more efficient and in, in everything that I already do, you know? So whether if I'm, and, and really what it's centered now on is um, being able to articulate my ideas into a score, you know, being able to, you know, have an idea for an arrangement or a composition for whether it's a small group or a large group and being to, and being able to articulate it and um, express it within a score using music notation software um, to be able to give it to the band and have them read it down with no questions and everything is clearly written and efficiently um, sort of structured, you know, I think that takes on a whole different level of skill set, you know, because time is very valuable. So when you're getting in, because I've been in situations where, um, uh, working with other musicians or composers where 
they just come to the band with fragments or we're in the recording studio and things aren't necessarily well thought out. And I just feel that that's another side of the, you know, musician skill set, you know, as a band leader or as a musician, that if you're going to bring, you know, new music, you should have it written, you know, very clearly and concise and have things structured efficiently so that, you know, it doesn't become a barrier in your ideas can be fully realized, you know? So I've been working on, you know, whether it's transcribing arrangements or solos and just focus on meticulously executing, you know, the idea of whatever I'm trying to write into a, you know, score form. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Um, I want to ask you now about, um, the Southern California jazz scene, because if, if I'm not mistaken, you're a San Diegan, right? You're based in San Diego. You have deep LA connections with a lot of the musicians here. You play here all the time. So I would love to hear whatever you have to say about jazz in Southern California. I mean, I, th I think that, you know, in terms of the scene, just like with scenes everywhere, there's always room for improvement, you know, and, you know, it's in a constant state of change. You know, so nothing, you have to realize that nothing lasts forever, you know, so whether it's a venue uh, coming, you know, opening or closing, or there are musicians moving into town or moving out of town, things are constantly in flux. And so you have to be incredibly flexible, no matter where you are, in order to, you know, sort of try to develop a, you know, long lasting career in any community. But speaking of Southern California, uh, specifically, I mean, it's what I know, it's what I've been raised in, you know, and I, I would say that I absolutely love it here in Southern California, but I would also say that there's all, there's always room for improvement in terms of, you know, there's not enough places for people to play, you know, not, not enough options and, you know, sometimes or most times the pay isn't the best and a lot of times it's very difficult to make um a living you know um perf performing you know uh, without you know relying on other you know streams of income which i think will always be the case you know because like i said things are always changing and the arts aren't necessarily the most valued um profession you know in the state you know you know, I'm not sure that they've ever been, but, um, you know, I personally love Southern California. However, I think there's definitely things that can happen within the music community that, you know, will benefit musicians if these changes are made. But it's a tough, it's a tough business. And, you know, I'm not going to lie. Sometimes I go back and forth, you know, with myself, if it's even, you know, worth the struggle, you know, because I, I can always play music, you know, just, you know, I could play for myself or, you know, just get together with other musicians and jam or, you know, work through other things. But as a business, trying to make a living, it's incredibly difficult and it could be, you know, frustrating. And at times you feel like perhaps it's not worth it, you know, but, you know, you, you know, you keep going until, you know, you feel like, you know, it's not for you or you just stick, you know, to your goals and stick to your path. And, you know, hopefully things will work out for the best in the long term, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I've been planning to ask you some questions about sort of social issues and I feel like this is a, as good a segue as any, um, how do you feel about the fact, uh, you as an artist, I mean, um, feel about the fact that so much of the public's as access to music uh, is now mediated, mediated by companies uh, such as Spotify? Um, I would say that I understand, you know, um, one, I don't think it's a fair business model if we're talking uh, specifically, more specifically how tech has basically taken over the the music industry because i feel like the it's the the tech companies who are you know structuring the value of what we make as artists 
and it sort of um, locks us into a sort of unfair business model where we are not really able to set the price for our, um, you know, our work, you know, our art, and the the price is ultimately uh, driven down, you know, to increase the profit margins for, you know, the, the, the tech companies and their shareholders, you know, so, but I understand business, why, why those particular companies are doing what they're doing, but I don't feel that it's in any way ad, um, advantageous to, um, you know, independent musicians who don't have the backing of, you know, the major labels or, you know, millions and millions of followers on, you know, Spotify or uh, on social media or, you know, who don't have that sort of, you know, access to the big promotional budgets, you know. So um, in that respect, the, you can play it, you know, many different ways, but some artists, you know, choose to, you know, do whatever they have to do uh, promotional wise or, you know, in, in, in collaboration with the tech companies to, you know, promote their music, which is, which is fine. And then there's some musicians who are just purely consumed by the, um, the process of making the art and they will um, present it, you know, and whoever buys it, buys it and, you know, and they'll just live by that mode. For me as an artist, I'm, I would say I'm still trying to grasp and learn, you know, um, what is, what does it mean to be an artist in this day and age and to, um, to, you know, try to make a living, you know, being a musician, improviser, composer, you know, um, I'm still trying to figure that out for myself, you know, with the decline of, um, you know, um, CDs and, and, and things like that. And of course there, there's like vinyl is definitely making a, a, a comeback, but I don't know if that's necessarily a sustainable business model over the long term to bet your, um, uh, to bet your career on the selling of merch or, you know, LPs, you know, I mean, you know, I mean, it, it, I, I, I don't know, but um, records cost a lot of money to make too. So the, the purchaser is going to be paying for the cost of the materials first. And yeah. then, I mean, if you add on a premium for the artist, yeah, it might get expensive for some people. Yeah. So I, I don't necessarily have an answer in terms of like a sustainable model, but I do think that the tech companies are only getting bigger. So if you're talking about Apple music, Spotify, um, title, um, Amazon Music. I know I'm forgetting, you know, some of the other big ones. I don't recall at this particular moment, but um, I feel that to, an certain, to a certain extent that you just have to, you know, learn to adapt because the world is in, like I said before, is in, you know, constantly changing as in, and is in flux. So you just have to, um, as the, as the puzzles pieces keep shifting, you just have to learn how to balance. But for me as an artist, I would say that I'm, I'm looking more towards alternate sources of funding, um, uh, primarily grants and fellowships and commissions and things like that, that are really geared towards, you know, the artist producing work. And ultimately through that being able to, um, produce, uh, you know, um, you know, whether it's albums or recordings or tours, be able to produce them independently. Um, and, you know, being able to use those resources to help promote and to get the word out there about what, what I'm doing as an artist, you know, you know, because I feel that a, lo a lot of that relies on, um, you know, in terms of the growth of you as a musician, as an artist, in terms of a growth in the marketplace relies heavily on 
promotion and promotional materials. And a lot of times if, if you're doing a GoFundMe or whatever for your latest album, there isn't a, a, a more in the budget for promotion, hiring a um, publicist or paying for ads or doing all these other things, which cost like thousands of dollars on their own, you know? So I feel like as artists, if we're able to grasp on the, um, promotional aspects, whether it's hiring a publicist or be becoming more savvy on your own and doing a lot of things via your social media. I think that's half of the battle, but, you know, the longer game and how you get, you know, income from these uh, tech companies who now have a hold on the, the medium and how music is consumed. I think that's a more difficult and involved um, uh, question and i think that ultimately the artists are a different uh, at a disadvantage because we lack the leverage you know absolutely yeah it's a sad state of affairs but it's true um mm -hmm. keeping on social issues but but shifting off of that one i gather um from some videos and writings uh that you shared on social media from uh terry lynn carrington um that you uh feel pretty deeply about the issue of gender equity in jazz. I wonder if you'd mind saying a few words about the changes you'd like to see in the jazz world, um, either specific to gender or anything else you feel uh, like discussing. Well, I'm definitely inspired by the work that Terry Lynn uh, Carrington is, is doing, you know, with the, um, with all of her initiatives, I think it's through Berkeley college of music, you know, because ultimately, you know, through the writings of, Angela Davis and like bell hooks and all the, you know, uh, black, uh, family, feminist, uh, writers and, um, essays that, that I've read. It's like, I, I'm definitely oriented towards, um, human rights and a general like equity in terms of how we approach all of these, you know, social spaces. So I would definitely like to see, um, more equity in terms of how, you know, uh, more equity in terms of our movement within these uh, primarily, pri primarily um, uh, male dominated spaces historically, you know? So um, me personally, I always, I, I try to do my best to support those sorts of um, uh, those movements. And I'm definitely not at the forefront, you know, and I, I, I'm just, um, I'm just, um, really want to, and I, honestly, I like to be, you know, in the, the background doing whatever I can, you know, so whatever volunteer work or even, you know, working with other musicians is like, I, I don't necessarily look to be in the forefront or, um, want the recognition. I just want to do, you know, and support and volunteer for things that I believe in. You know, so whether that's anything from um, uh, uh, sharing something on social media that I believe in or going down to a rally and setting up chairs or, you know, giving an interview and speaking about different topics or, you know, um, doing more uh, doing anything that I can for the, the causes that I believe in, you know, but definitely I, I definitely believe that um, there has been a sort of. Um, hostility and somewhat uh, to change in, you know, the, the pr primarily male dominated, you know, jazz uh, community. But I believe through, you know, um, people like Terry Lynn Carrington, things are, you know, changing over time, but I, I know it's going to be very slow, you know. Absolutely. It seems like, uh, it seems like it always is. Um, let's see, I'm going to, I'm going to take us pretty far off topic from talking about the arts here. Um, so it's, it's totally fine if it's uh, too far outside the scope of what uh, you came to talk about today. Um, but as I was researching you, and like I said, kind of going through uh, posts that you'd shared on social media, uh, I noticed some stuff about uh, guaranteed healthcare and guaranteed housing. I wonder if you'd care to say anything about those policy proposals. Um, I, I think that, you know, again, in, um, you know, 
viewing my, you know, sort of political, you know, beliefs towards human rights, I definitely think that, you know, guaranteed education, guaranteed housing, guaranteed livable wage, guaranteed health care should be, you know, a sort of um, uh, primary sort of need, and especially in a country that has the resources, um, you know, to do such a thing, because I believe that, you know, through those, um, through, I, I, I believe that through investment in people, you know, and not in corporations is really what will, you know, help elevate the quality of life in our country, you know, and, you know, not, not only our country, but being able to, you know, help, you know, others and to be able to, you know, protect, you know, um, you know, life, you know, human life and, you know, the environment. If, if we have a sort of focus on the, not only just human rights, but, you know, protecting the environment and, you know, through these initiatives, through housing and uh, health care and education and living wage and, you know, um, you know um, really providing for people, you um, in terms of uh, food and just all, all these things and, you know, clean water, you know, th these should be, you know, human rights, especially since, you know, this country, you know, which proclaims to be, you know, the richest nation on the face of the earth, you know, can do more to help and have a passion for, you know, the care of, you know, its residents, you know. Mm, mm. Thank you so much for that answer. Um, and I want to close uh, the interview by asking you, I understand that this week um, you're, you're uh, involved in recording an album or involved in some kind of recording project. I wonder if you could uh, share a little bit of information about that. Oh, yeah, sure. So um, later this week, I was scheduled to record a live album with, you know, in Los Angeles at ETA in Highland Park with uh, trumpeter uh, Daniel Rosenblum, Rosenblum, but it has since been canceled due to the uh, the Omicron variant of COVID-19. So um, we have we have since like postponed or rescheduled that you know particular session. Um, but you know that's just that's just how it goes. And actually, I was supposed to be going to New York the f next week. Um, for the winter um, jazz fest with Steph Richards um, uh, and Ravi Coltrane, but of course that was postponed as well. So um, a lot of things are are happening, but hopefully later this year things will um, sort of open back up again. I have a a, a tour scheduled for Europe in April, um, some other teaching positions during the summertime but you just never know these days. So I'm, I'll put them in, on my calendar, but, you know, I'm just prepared for, you know, I might get that call if there's another variant that happens and, you know, things will be postponed once again. So. <laughs> yeah. I think we're, we're all taking our plans with a grain of salt these days. Um, yeah. But well, Joshua White, it's been such a privilege. I mean, I, I can't even uh, express it. Thank you so much for for clearing some time in your schedule uh, to sit down and talk to me, and for uh, sharing your musical and artistic and political perspectives. It's 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 been a real gift. Well, thank you for having me. I mean, I really appreciate you taking the time to you know meet with me. You know, so so yeah, you know, I definitely anytime. Thank you so much.